Hello, curious minds, and welcome back to How Why Tube, your channel for unraveling the science behind the world around us. Think about it. Sound is everywhere. The chirping of birds waking you up, your favorite song playing on the radio, the comforting voice of a friend, even the annoying buzz of a mosquito. We are constantly bathed in a symphony of sounds. But have you ever stopped to truly wonder, what is sound? And how does this invisible phenomenon travel through the air, reach our ears, and magically transform into something we understand and feel? Well, you've come to the right place. Today, we're diving deep into the fascinating physics of sound and the incredible biology of human hearing. We'll explore invisible waves, vibrating eardrums, and the delicate dance of mechanics and neurology that allows us to perceive the world through sound. Get ready to have your ears opened, metaphorically speaking, of course. So, let's start with the absolute basics. What is sound? At its core, sound begins with a vibration. Imagine plucking a guitar string. You see it wobble back and forth rapidly, right? That wobble, that vibration, disturbs the air molecules surrounding it. Think of it like dropping a pebble into a calm pond. Ripples spread outwards from the point of impact. Sound waves are similar, but instead of water waves moving up and down, sound waves are longitudinal waves, or pressure waves. This means the particles of the medium, usually air for us, get squished together, compression, and then spread apart, rarefaction, pushing energy outwards from the source. And here's a crucial point. Sound needs a medium to travel. It needs something to vibrate. Air, water, wood, metal, these can all carry sound. But what about the vast emptiness of space? That's right. In the near-perfect vacuum of space, there are virtually no particles to vibrate. So despite what you see in many sci-fi movies, space is actually silent. No epic spaceship explosion sounds, unfortunately. Okay, so sound waves travel through a medium. But not all sounds are the same, are they? We hear high-pitched squeaks and low-pitched rumbles. We hear gentle whispers and deafening roars. What makes sounds different? Two key properties come into play, frequency and amplitude. First, let's talk about frequency. This refers to how quickly the sound source is vibrating or how many wave cycles, one compression and one rarefaction, pass a point each second. We measure frequency in hertz. A high frequency means rapid vibrations, resulting in a high-pitched sound. Think of a tiny flute or a squeaking mouse. A low frequency means slower vibrations, creating a low-pitched sound, like a deep bass drum or thunder rumbling in the distance. Humans can typically hear sounds ranging from about 20 hertz, a very low rumble, up to about 20,000 hertz, a very high-pitched whine. As we age, this upper range often decreases, and many animals, like dogs and bats, can hear frequencies much higher than we can. Now, what about loudness? That's determined by the amplitude of the sound wave, Amplitude relates to the intensity or energy of the vibrations. Think of it as the height of the wave, or more accurately, the maximum pressure difference the wave creates. A wave with a large amplitude carries more energy and sounds louder. Imagine hitting a drum hard versus tapping it gently. The harder hit creates a bigger vibration, a larger amplitude, and a louder sound. We usually measure sound intensity or loudness in decibels. A whisper might be around 30 decibels, a normal conversation around 60 decibels, and a loud rock concert or a jet engine can easily exceed 110 to 120 decibels. It's important to remember that prolonged exposure to very high amplitude sounds can damage our hearing. So we have these sound waves compressions and rarefactions, traveling through the air,
carrying information about pitch and loudness. But how do we actually perceive them? This is where the incredible machinery of the human ear comes in. Our ear is a marvel of biological engineering, divided into three main parts, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The journey begins with the outer ear. That fleshy part you can see, called the pinna, acts like a funnel, collecting sound waves and directing them into the ear canal. At the end of the ear canal lies the eardrum, or tympanic membrane. This thin, taut membrane vibrates when the incoming sound waves hit it, just like the skin of a drum. These vibrations are then passed on to the middle ear, a small air-filled chamber containing three tiny interconnected bones, the smallest bones in your body, often called the hammer, malleus, anvil, incus, and stirrup, stapes. These bones act like a sophisticated lever system. They amplify the vibrations from the relatively large eardrum and transmit them to a much smaller window leading into the inner ear. This amplification is crucial, especially for hearing fainter sounds. Now we reach the inner ear, the real control center of hearing. Here the amplified vibrations enter the cochlea. The cochlea is a spiral-shaped, fluid-filled structure that looks remarkably like a snail shell. Inside the cochlea are thousands upon thousands of microscopic hair cells. When the vibrations from the middle ear enter the cochlea, they create waves in the fluid inside. These fluid waves cause different sections of a structure called the basilar membrane within the cochlea to move. Crucially, different parts of this membrane respond best to different frequencies. High frequencies stimulate hair cells near the entrance of the cochlea, while low frequencies stimulate hair cells further inside, towards the tip of the spiral. As the basilar membrane moves, it bends the tiny hair cells sitting on top of it. This bending action is the magic moment. It converts the mechanical energy of the vibrations into electrical signals. These electrical signals are then picked up by the auditory nerve, which sends them zipping off to the brain. Finally, it's our brain's job to interpret these electrical signals, decoding them based on which nerve fibers are firing, telling it the pitch, and how rapidly they are firing, contributing to the perception of loudness. The brain then combines this information with context and memory, allowing us to recognize the sound as speech, music, a warning signal, or just background noise. It's an incredibly complex process that happens almost instantaneously. Amazing, isn't it? From a simple vibration to a complex perception in the brain. But let's circle back to how sound travels. We know it needs a medium, and we know it travels as waves. But does it travel at the same speed in all media? Absolutely not. The speed of sound depends heavily on the properties of the medium it's traveling through, primarily its density and elasticity. In air, at room temperature, around 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit, sound travels at approximately 343 meters per second or about 1,125 feet per second. This is quite fast, but definitely not instantaneous. Think about seeing lightning before you hear the thunder. Sound travels much faster in liquids like water, about 1,484 meters per second. This is because water molecules are packed much more closely together than air molecules allowing vibrations to pass between them more efficiently. This is vital for marine animals like whales and dolphins that use sound to communicate and navigate over vast distances using sonar. Sound travels even faster in most solids. In steel, for instance, sound can zip along at nearly 6,000 meters per second. Why? The atoms in solids are tightly bound in a rigid structure allowing vibrations to be transmitted very quickly. You might have experienced this as a kid by putting your ear to a long metal fence or railing 
and hearing someone tap it from far away. Much sooner than you'd hear it through the air. Or the classic example of hearing a train approaching by listening to the tracks. Though please don't actually do that, it's dangerous. So, the general rule is sound travels slowest in gases, faster in liquids, and fastest in solids. And remember, it can't travel at all in a vacuum. Understanding the physics of sound and hearing isn't just academic curiosity, it has countless real-world applications and impacts on our daily lives. Music and instruments. Every musical instrument is designed to create vibrations at specific frequencies and amplitudes, carefully controlled to produce melodies and harmonies. Communication. Speech itself is just complex patterns of sound waves we create and decode. Technologies like phones and radios rely on converting sound waves into other signals and back again. Technology, sonar, sound, navigation and ranging uses sound waves bouncing off objects underwater for mapping the seabed or locating submarines. Medical ultrasound uses very high frequency sound waves beyond human hearing to create images of inside the body like checking on a developing baby. Architecture. Acoustics is the science of how sound behaves in spaces. Concert halls and recording studios are meticulously designed to control reflections and reverberation, ensuring sound clarity and quality. Safety and awareness. Our ability to hear alerts us to dangers, like fire alarms, car horns, or someone calling for help. Conversely, noise pollution from traffic, construction, or industry can be stressful and even harmful to our health. So, the next time you listen to music, have a conversation, or simply hear the sounds of the world around you, take a moment to appreciate the incredible journey those sound waves have taken from their vibrating source, through the air, or water, or solid, funneled by your outer ear, amplified by your middle ear, translated into electrical signals by the delicate hair cells in your cochlea, and finally interpreted by your amazing brain. We've covered a lot today. Sound as vibrations traveling in waves, the crucial need for a medium, the meaning of frequency, pitch, and amplitude, loudness, the step-by-step -step mechanics of how our outer, middle, and inner ears work together, including the cochlea and auditory nerve, and how the speed of sound changes dramatically, depending on whether it's traveling through air, water, or solids. It truly is a symphony of physics and biology happening every single moment. We hope this journey into the world of sound has sparked your curiosity just as much as it fascinates us here at How Why Tube. If you learned something new today and enjoyed this explanation, please give this video a thumbs up. It really helps the channel. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss our next exploration into the hows and whys of everyday science. What sound phenomenon fascinates you the most? Let us know in the comments below. We love hearing from our community of curious minds. Thanks for watching How Why Tube, where we make science make sense. Until next time, keep asking questions.